So, um, if you are joining us today, and uh, as promised, uh, we are live at COP26, uh, which is um, uh, a very, uh, I can call it the world's leading uh, event uh, on climate change. And um, this isn't just uh, an hyperbole, this isn't just an exclamation. I knew it would be a very big event, but uh, nothing prepared me for what uh, happened um, the first time I entered this hall. Uh, it's, um, where I currently am uh, is the media center uh, for coverage uh, for journalists from different parts of the world uh, that are here to cover uh, COP26. And according to the organizers, uh, over 3,000 journalists uh, have been uh, were accredited uh, to cover uh, this big uh, event and um, as you can see um, we this is actually uh, a one hand of the hall as everybody has seen the industry everybody here uh, they are whole journalists uh, from different media organizations and um, the organizers were very nice enough to provide um, uh, spots and uh, connections uh, even if you don't have uh, your, this system here uh, you can actually uh, still borrow their system uh, to uh, write your stories and there are also different, different spots uh, for you to conduct interviews uh, this uh, this right behind me uh, is where you uh, we, have, we actually have uh, interview spots uh, for those uh, that want to do um, live um, transmissions and uh, we've seen lots of devices and lots of uh, uh, tools uh, being displayed uh, for uh, journalists uh, from different parts of the world that wants to actually uh, cover this event and uh, for me uh, is actually an uh, enlightening eye-opening experience um, because uh, this is the first time uh, that I will actually be attending my first COP. Uh, prior to getting to this place, uh, we had lots of orientations around uh, what to expect, but nothing prepared me, like I said, uh, for the magnitude nature of what uh, I'm experiencing uh, here. Uh, lots of, uh, I know you would have had uh, a number of uh, developments uh, around uh, conversations and uh, dialogues at COP26. Yeah, so um, this actually how um, it all started, and um, he actually set uh, the brand, uh, putting face, uh, putting the face to some of the issues that uh, why uh, it's important uh, for global leaders uh, to actually prioritize uh, climate change issues. And um, another talk that uh, also uh, gained uh, a lot of attention and, uh, during the opening ceremony uh, was a presentation uh, by the, was a, a speech delivered uh, by the president of Bib uh, Barbados, sorry if I did not pronounce that very well, uh, sorry, the Prime Minister of Barbados. Uh, she has always been uh, very eloquent, uh, she has always been uh, talking in support of climate change, uh, trying to get uh, countries uh, to take uh, more serious uh, actions around it. Communities, this is immoral is it okay? and it is unjust. Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic has taught us that national solutions to global problems do not work. We come to Glasgow with global ambition to save our people and to save our planet. But we now find three gaps. On mitigation, climate pledges or NDCs. Without more, we will leave the world on a pathway to 2.7 degrees. And with more, we are still likely to get to two degrees. These commitments made by some are based on technologies yet to be developed and this is at best reckless and at worst dangerous. On finance, we are $20 billion short of the 100 billion. And this commitment, even then, might only be met in 2023. On adaptation, adaptation finance remains only at 25%. Not the 50-50 split that was promised nor needed given the warming that is already taking place on this earth. Climate finance to frontline small island developing states 
declined by 25% in 2019. Failure to provide the critical finance and that of loss and damage is measured, my friends, in lives and livelihoods in our communities. This is immoral and it is unjust. If Glasgow is to deliver on the promises of Paris, it must close these three gaps. So I ask to you, what must we say to our people living on the front line in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Pacific, when both ambition and regrettably some of the needed faces at Glasgow are not present? What excuse should we give for the failure? In the words of that Caribbean icon, Eddie Grant, will they mourn us on the front line? When will we, as world leaders across the world, address the pressing issues that are truly causing our people angst and worry, whether it is climate or whether it is vaccines? Simply put, when will leaders lead? Our people are watching and our people are taking note. And are we really going to leave Scotland without the resolve and the ambition that is sorely needed to save lives and to save our planet? How many? Yeah, so um, this was uh, quite uh, important for me uh, because uh, it's really good uh, for you to have uh, a good background on what uh, the key uh, issues uh, in Glasgow are. Uh, for instance, um, Looking at what the dialogues and conversations that are happening here, uh, what we've heard so far is not that uh, a new agreement uh, should come up. Uh, instead, um, what is being discussed are ways towards ensuring that uh, the ambitious targets uh, set in the Paris Agreement uh, are quickly met. And uh, this Prime Minister's speech uh, was actually quite important for me because uh, she was able to actually draw the connection that is much important between uh, climate change uh, and healthcare. Uh, she was able to say that, uh, she said, uh, it's not just about maybe the money is not there uh, for, fee, uh, for countries uh, to take uh, climate change uh, more seriously. Uh, it's just that uh, the commitment, uh, the interest uh, and the desires uh, to make the much needed uh, sacrifices uh, are still lacking uh, from governments uh, of different countries. And uh, she also said the fact, she also mentioned the fact that uh, some countries that are actually expected to be at the table, uh, the president uh, and uh, the indirectly she was referring to um, she was referring to uh, China uh, and Russia. Uh, if you know, uh, China leads the world uh, in greenhouse gas emission. Uh, several issues around uh, climate change uh, are also directly affecting China. But the president of the country uh, is not here, and um, so uh, she, that was the direct stop. Uh, and also, we also have the president of Russia uh, that is also not present. Uh, Russia, uh, China, India, and uh, the US, they are quite important uh, in achieving some of the ambitious goals of the climate change and uh, this is because uh, they are leading in their missions. So uh, from the few, uh, the, uh, from the four, whatever you can get uh, from those uh, clips, I think uh, it provides a better understanding of why uh, this is so. Uh, prior to this, uh, one of the things that is also quite peculiar about COP26, especially for the health aspect, is the availability of uh, health uh, pavilion. Uh, pavilion, uh, for those, uh, I, I can't imagine I'm, I'm my first COP and I'm already using their own terminologies. For you to be able to communicate very well at COP, uh, you should be able to have like uh, a grocery of what uh, is happening. So, like I said, uh, if I just join us, uh, I'm reaching you right from the media center uh, where journalists uh, are doing uh, their work. Uh, everybody you see around me uh, is a journalist. Uh, people are actually going live uh, from here. As you can see, uh, this person uh, is working, <laughs> is actually doing, going live uh, to the TV uh, station right from here. And
And um, so for you to be able to uh, accurately cover COP and uh, actually the climate change conversations, uh, there are lots of topics uh, for you to cover uh, if climate change is something uh, that you are interested in uh, reporting. For instance, we have the politics, uh, politics uh, around the different countries, uh, countries that, are, that believe that the economy, their own economies rely heavily on climate, uh, climate change. Uh, for instance, uh, China is seen as a factory of the world and um, if uh, it is not strategic about how it costs down emission, uh, uh, there could be direct effects on, uh, on the economy. Uh, we also have uh, countries, on the other hand, we have countries that are also at the forefront of renewable energy. Uh, development uh, when there are commitments around uh, compelling the rest of the world to take more bold actions they're expected to also be favored uh, from the business perspective we also have countries that also rely on conversations and dialogues around COP26 for them to be able to access more funds uh, for instance uh, some African countries uh, uh, I was uh, really uh, every year uh, uh, Countries across the world are expected to uh, submit what is called their nationally determined uh, C is called NDCs. Uh, I will I'll find out what the last is. Nationally determined, uh, maybe targets, uh, is, is a set of targets that the countries are committed to achieving. So uh, while I was reviewing some of the, some for the various countries, you can see that uh, many African countries uh, would heavily rely on uh, developed world uh, for them to be able to achieve some of these targets. And this is not just a wish, a real wish, a wish on their own part. It is something that is quite embedded in the Paris Agreement for the rich countries uh, to provide funds uh, for countries, we are, for developing countries. Uh, I think uh, according to Paris Agreement, every year they are expected to provide like $100 billion. But, uh, see, and this was expected to have been done since the year 2020, that was last year. But uh, in the days leading to COP26, it was announced that this target uh, cannot be met and uh, can only be met in 2023. But at this uh, COP, we are seeing uh, conversations around not just the developed countries, is providing funds again, um, but also actively engaging uh, the private sector to commit up to hundreds of billions of dollars uh, towards ambitious goals. And uh, just two days ago, uh, the US government and the EU uh, led over 100 countries uh, to sign what is described as the Global Methane Project, uh, a Global Methane Pledge. What methane simply, uh, Global Methane Pledge simply means is that they are committing to, uh, to reduce, drastically reduce um, in uh, emission and uh, while CO2 is seen as is very popular, uh, methane is also very popular and it's a very uh, is it, it's also dangerous uh, to the environment and uh, so we are seeing lots of pledges and I think just yesterday uh, India also announced is also partnering with the uh, UK government on what is described as uh, the uh, the solar grid project in which uh, different countries will be connected to grid uh, electricity system powered by solar it's not just it won't just be national uh, it will be something that joins different countries uh, together and uh, why this prove exciting uh, i would like to caution actually when i was talking to those that are veteran journalists that have been covering COP, uh, COP for years uh, they said that is how ambitious ideas uh, are shared and I've been trying to actually get, uh, for instance, we have some African countries that are also agreeing to these ambitious projects. And um, so some of them, when, when I, uh, even though they've committed to it, uh, when you ask them what are the, what are the, what are your plans towards achieving um, these goals, uh, they do tell you that uh, they are going to study it very well and um, they are going to figure it out. So those are the things uh, that you have to be conscious of while reporting these ambitious projects. And uh, I've been talking to a lot of people and uh, I think I've been interviewing a lot of, uh, quite a number of persons that uh, they are also bringing uh, interesting uh, angles, uh, interesting uh, dynamics uh, to the conversation. And um, I will, because uh, I would like to share uh, the experience of, of um, one of the journalists uh, that I interviewed. Uh, she's from uh, South Africa, and uh, this is also her first uh, COP, and uh, 
so it was it's quite interesting for you to see uh, the event, uh, the proceedings there through the eyes of our fellow journalists. Um, we launched PD recently and yeah it's been about six months of climate and environmental reporting and yeah that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, so let's talk about uh, climate change reporting for you as a journalist. Uh, how did you start and uh, what climate issues are you always excited to report and talk about? Definitely so I um, Wait, say the question again. <laughs> I'm trying to understand you as a climate change reporter. What kind of climate change stories do you write? Okay. okay. Look at you, right? Yeah, you can, yeah, look at me, guys. Okay. So I am, I got into um, climate journalism through a fellowship that I first did on climate justice um, by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and basically there I kind of got a sense of how to tell stories that are more focused on the human aspect of, um, of the climate crisis so looking at how the crisis actually affects people on the ground and how it affects their daily lives and projections of how their lives could actually change um, as a result of the climate crisis. So since then, I've kind of taken that, um, that learning onto my current position at the Daily Maverick and I'm looking to, to highlight how South Africans particularly are affected by the climate crisis, what effects um, it, it has on their lives, but also highlighting the disparities between um, you know, the massive uh, class gap that we have in South Africa and showing how as much as the climate crisis is expected to um, have these dev devastating effects such as water shortages and food shortages that um, showing through my reporting that these are challenges that lower class people in South Africa are currently facing. Um, so even though there is supposed to be, you know, it's, there's a lot of foresight on, on how the climate crisis will affect um, people, but there's also, you know, a reality that people are living through, but disproportionately affecting, you know, lower class um, citizens. The way you answer that question shows that uh, it's actually something you're uh, quite passionate about. <laughs> <laughs> very passionate about, very you passionate about. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, um, how has, uh, let's talk about your COP26 reporting experience. So, how has that been for you? Oh, COP... COP26 experience, um... So going into it, I, I was very aware that it's going to be very chaotic. Um, arriving at COP26 is chaotic beyond my expectations. <laughs> but I, I think I'm going to specify that the chaos was definitely around the World Leaders Summit. So a lot of the press was trying to, you know, get their eyes on who's here, what, what people, what the world leaders are saying. And since then, it's, it's, it's calmed down a little. And I think even both the day before the World Leaders Summit, which was the official first day, um, the opening, things were quite calm. So I think the chaos that I was expecting was probably the World Leaders Summit, which was the peak of it, I suspect. Um, but outside of that, I think it's a great experience. It's still quite overwhelming. I'm still landing. Um, trying to find my feet in terms of how to navigate the different events that are happening and trying to find stories around what is happening but also not just you know 
parroting what the leaders are saying in a story. Um, I think also for me it's important to to link what's happening with what's happening on the ground in terms of current affairs in my country and trying to find the links between those two um, those two spaces. So yeah, navigating all of those dynamics is, is a bit challenging and I think it brings in and highlights the chaos that I expected. But um, I think overall it's, it's a great experience and definitely a lot of learning and something that will help propel my career forward. Now, um, what are your expectations uh, as a journalist uh, from COP26? Hmm. So my expectations for, for COP26 are definitely meeting new people, network, growing my network, um, but I think also gaining a greater sense of the role that global networks play in driving climate change at a more national level. Um, I think a lot of the time we as journalists look to our local government and our national governments and we're constantly bombarding them asking them you know what are you doing what can we expect what are you going to be doing about the latest um, climate crisis report and I think now it's I think it's becoming clearer that obviously a lot of it is dependent on them but also their actions are based on global agreements and also how the climate action that look, makes them look at a global stage um, and what they can bargain for once they, they take those, those climate actions. So yeah, for me expectations are definitely learning more about um, the chain of how, how things work from a global level and how that trickles down to a more national level and what influence that has on, on driving climate change within my country. So, um, this was not this, and it's okay to them, but I think yeah. it's important. What do you think uh, journalists need to be better equipped to perfect, uh, accurately report climate change to the extent that journalists are able to contribute towards achieving the set goals of uh, protecting the climate? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the tools that journalists need in order to drive climate action um, would definitely, first of all, be a climate dictionary. <laughs> um, I mean, just to like kind of hash out all of the terms, because I think we get so caught up in um, being in that space and using the jargon that we we write we end up writing for ourselves and the people that are only within that space. So I think that would help. But also on a more holistic note, I think that we would definitely need more access. I think to to the scientists, but also. Um, more funding, I think, to actually go about exploring these stories and and having more means to to broaden our outlook and I think more training sessions because I think it's also such a growing space and the information is constantly coming in and it can be really overwhelming. So I think ongoing support from our newsrooms in terms of how to navigate um, the space and tell better stories for our audience is really important. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what else to say on that. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, damn, you look so good on camera. I'm thank serious. you, thank Let you. Oh yeah, you were not supposed to. <laughs> you were not supposed to hear. <laughs> you were not supposed to hear all that. <laughs> Okay, uh, now so um, back, uh, let me see, can you, okay, uh, you really cannot say um, this is where uh, your nest, I want to be as comfortable as possible today, so, so uh, yeah, let's talk like this, so you really cannot say uh, where your nest story is coming from, uh, so I was just sitting at the African Junior's uh, Pavilion, and I met this really cool guy. Uh, he was just sitting too. Uh, he had this very prominent face mask on. And um, so I just looked at his, um, at his uh, name tag and I saw that he's from the Royal College 
uh, of psychiatry. So everybody uh, attending this uh, has uh, something, uh, has a batch like this. Uh, I need to see where you are from. So every journalist has this. So this is mine. Uh, let me see. So this is mine, as you can see. my. Uh, it was so short in category. So I saw his own. I quickly read it and um, I saw that it's from the Royal College of uh, Psychiatry. So I became curious about uh, what is a psychiatrist uh, doing in a, con in, a um, in a climate change uh, conference? And we began to talk, and um, I said, "Oh, this is something that will be very, very relevant uh, for you guys, uh, especially those that are interested uh, in further writing uh, climate change uh, stories." Uh, so, um, before I share, I, sh I share what he said. Uh, I think uh, it is really important for you to meet. Uh, panelists uh, today. So I have four amazing panelists uh, for you, uh, as you can see. Uh, so the first person that you've seen before her, uh, her name is uh, Unke Nguka. That was the lady that spoke and uh, she's a climate journalist with South Africa based at Daily Maverick. Uh, the next person you'll be hearing uh, you'll be hearing from now is Dr. Jacob uh, Kranowski, uh, who is the coordinator of the Green Walking Initiative. Uh, from the Royal College of Psychiatrists and uh, the Institutions uh, Center, uh, the Institutions uh, Center uh, for uh, Center for Sustainable uh, Healthcare. So, like I said, uh, we're just sitting. Uh, he was uh, sitting at one of the pavilions, and uh, I just walked up to him uh, regarding uh, his conversation. Now we began to talk. So, at some point, I just said. Can you just pause and let me get my camera? Uh, our, our, our members would really like your story, which I think should be also allow you to write uh, health-focused uh, stories uh, for uh, your audience. Uh, so this is uh, trying to look at the connection between uh, climate change uh, and mental health. Research which is showing that there's increased rates. So, so, uh, uh, it will be able to attract research and quantitative research. What we know is that a lot of children and young people are struggling with what's being described as eco-anxiety, which not, is not itself a mental illness, but ultimately is describing a very real reaction to what is a dramatic shift in the world, uh, in the world that, we, that they're going to be inheriting. And so I think an experience of distress and anxiety is something that needs to be recognized. Increasingly, you're hearing things about uh, terms such as solastalgia, which is the loss of a place and distress for having lost a place. And I think that shouldn't really come as, as any surprise to anyone. So these are new concepts that are coming up in, the, in, in, how to, in looking to study how people respond to these dramatic changes to the environment. Um, and in addition, you're getting more quantitative research, which is showing that there's increased rates of, of things like anxiety and depression and PTSD associated with climate change-related events, such as flooding, for example. Okay, and then um, what are the major climate events or oh yeah <laughs> got it okay so um what are the major climate change events that you think have the strongest impact so i think that so the ones that we we've been able to study or that we know about are in particular floods uh heat waves um Heat floods and heat waves, there's a bit more being known about, for example, fires and wildfires. Um, but also I think what, more broadly, sort of the loss of natural spaces um, is, is being recognized to have an impact on people's sense of distress and their experience of distress. But in terms of linking things such as suicide rates and um, more formal diagnoses such as PTSD, those are being more seen along with events such as for as I said before, sort of flooding, but also additionally heat waves. Okay, gathering uh, evidence, gathering um, evidence to substantiate this. Mm. So what are the uh, what metrics do you think can be used to really substantiate the connection between climate change and, uh, and mental health? Yeah, so the sort of metrics that you can be looking at is the number of visits to the hospital for people describing certain complaints. Um, you can do more complicated statistical studies where you control for different variables and look to basically single out people's, the incidence or the new emergence of, um, of new mental, mental illnesses. 
Um, and so ultimately you're looking at new diagnoses being made and then looking to control for other variables which might account for that, which is really difficult work. Because again, this is a, mental health is very multifactorial. It's very difficult to say that there's just one, one cause. Um, because our mental health is informed by the environment, by our work, by our families. And so to, to get to the bottom of it is quite challenging. But nonetheless, we are seeing these very strong themes emerging. Okay, uh, as a scientist and as an expert, what kind of actions do you think need to be urgently taken? And um, what would really be a dream come true for you okay. from COP26? Um, I think a, a dream come true for me would be for people to walk away with an understanding that well, I mean, ultimately, that there's there's consensus from the highest emitting countries for their need to support the the entirety of the globe towards reaching 1.5 degrees. I think that's ultimately the dream that we're all hoping for. But I think, from a point of view of health, I think it's really crucial if people could walk away with an understanding this is going to affect their minds and their bodies, and that it, you know we can talk about finance, we can talk about energy, we can talk about all these sort of systemic solutions, but ultimately this is very much about ourselves uh, and how we are able to, to how, you know, how we're able to manage our, our sense of agency in the world and how we're able to maintain healthy, healthy lives for ourselves and our families. Um, and so I think that there's a really large emphasis that should be made on the impact of inequality because inequality is one of the largest drivers of health disparity. And if we could also manage inequality, we would have a much more sustainable health service which could actually accommodate, which would be both better for the planet and better for people generally. So I think talking about inequality and its impact on mental health and, and physical health, but health generally would be, um, so this emphasis on prevention and recognizing the impact of inequality on people's health would be something I think would be, I would really look forward to and be really um, inspired by and, ha and glad for. So let's talk about, um, well maybe, uh, what is your assessment of um, climate change and mental health reporting and um, in terms of the stuff you are reading about it, yeah. uh, what is your honest assessment? I think that mental health is, is, is very much not spoken of, it's not very much considered and I think that's reflected about how the general thinking about mental health is a very complicated area, um, it's one that people are increasingly talking about but you don't really see it discussed very much. Um, I think it's also very important to make a difference between illness and a, and a very normal response. So I don't. I think it's important to say that, you know, we're not trying to pathologize people's reactions. But if you had, um, you know, I think it's understandable that if you have your entire community put at risk because of a lack of water, and to say that people are responding with stress, I mean, that's a normal response. And I think it's important that we don't pathologize people's reactions, but I think also we should be able to think about why this is an injustice that people's mental health is being impacted upon, and that if that's helpful in terms of talking about the need for change, then I, I think that's really important that we consider that angle. But I think generally it's one that's not very well explored or talked about. And if you look at the structuring of One Health, one health Initiative, mm -hmm. um, that looks at environment, uh, animals and plants and yeah. activities, um, what um, do you think uh, mental health is properly integrated? Um, I'm not so familiar with the One Health framework myself, but I think that if you look at the sort of field of planetary health generally, this idea that a healthy planet means healthy people is something that I think is very well appreciated. And I think it's, you know, ultimately you have to look after the body to look after the mind. And I think that these disparities between, or these divisions aren't, aren't necessarily we should be looking to have a much more holistic view of human health. Um, you know, talking about things such as the idea of maintaining well-being um, and not just talking about illness, talking about how to keep people healthy. Um, because I think health, if, if you allow people the chance to be healthy, then I think people will be more able to, to be resilient and to adapt and to come up with the solutions uh, and to be community focused. And so I think a lot of what mental health is interested in is about connections between people and those relationships between not just people in their communities, but also the relationship to the land and to nature and to biodiversity generally within wherever they're sitting. And so I think we're very much interested in what's happening in between. And it's, so, it's harder to talk about and it's harder to address, but it's something I think when you talk about, people can really identify with. Do you think there is a knowledge gap? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, 
The knowledge gap is, is definitely from point of view of research, that we need to be doing more research to understand what's happening, but I also think that we shouldn't use that as a barrier to start talking about it more. So I think looking at the impact on people's mental health is a, is a definitive gap within the knowledge. Um, I think we have serious gaps in terms of funding disparity. So there's a, a gross disparity generally in the global mental health crisis where in spite of it having so much impact on, on people's livelihoods, it's very poorly funded both in the north and in the south. And so I think if we're going to talk seriously about giving people an opportunity at good health, you need to be talking seriously about funding mental health as well. Um, but that's a gap that you see all over the world. So generally there's this, there's, as I said, the research gap, but also a funding gap. Um, and it's and it also just trying to create the health systems necessary to be able to provide people with good health, but also supporting communities to do that themselves. And not simply asking the health service to, to design that, but actually providing communities with the resources to build up resilience and to build up the networks which provide people with good mental health. So again, complicated solutions with lots of gaps. <laughs> I really enjoy your conversation. Maybe um, my last question. Yes. Sure. Some people comes up with this. Um, what can you say about um, maybe evidences from developing countries uh, regarding uh, this kind of research? Well, I think there's there's really good work from um, people like Vikram Patel, uh, who work within the global mental health community, which look to basically train people within communities to be mental health representatives. And so you're not actually trying to create systems or healthcare systems, but you look to basically bring awareness to the possibility of communities basically building, bu being able to support themselves. And so you train people up locally. Um, and so there's very good evidence, but again, that has to be supported by, well, supported by both the sort of research, which is available, but also by communities taking it up and being supported to do that as well. So what's your research interest? Um, I'm, I'm not a researcher, I'm actually a clinician. Wow. Um, so I work more, I'm, I work within mental health in the UK, in the NHS, and I've been trained as a psychiatrist in the UK, and I sort of consider myself more of an advocate than, I, than a researcher. Um, and I speak mostly to the, um, the need for mental health professionals to talk about and to represent the impact of climate change on mental health and health more generally. Um, and I have a specific interest on talking about the interface between nature and mental health and how we can look to nature to improve our mental health um, but also by looking after nature we can also support ourselves as well. So throughout um, these uh, COP26, what are... Yeah, so um, I think uh, that is, uh, that was quite uh, an interesting uh, conversation for me and uh, I promise uh, one of the things I plan to do is to actually take you around the entire facility. That's why I'm trying to cut those interviews uh, as short as possible. And uh, the last person, um, uh, I had two things. Uh, I still have two interviews that I would have loved uh, to show you, uh, but so that we have uh, enough time to look at this facility. Uh, so the last person uh, that I, I would like us to, you guys to meet, uh, is uh, Alexia Latote, uh, who is the deputy CEO for the US government owned uh, Millennium Challenger Corporation. Uh, Alexia is also a nominee, uh, has also been nominated uh, by President Biden uh, as the Assistant Secretary uh, of the Treasury uh, for International Markets. And uh, so, uh, like I said, uh, you, will not, you cannot know uh, who you are going to meet at COP26, uh, you will just see uh, individuals. Uh, and uh, so as journalists, uh, you are expected uh, to actually be the one uh, to quickly, easily identify these people and quickly spring up questions right on the go. And um, so uh, what is, why is this important? Why is this conversation important? Because uh, we now at COP26, uh, we see the US government attempt uh, to go back to, to start saying that climate change is a top priority. So, uh, so I was able to ask her a couple of questions on how the US government is attempting to separate, uh, to make climate change independent such that irrespective of which party uh, is, uh, is in charge of the governance and uh, she would, uh, the world would continue to know that uh, the US government 
uh, is back on track. So we'll take a listen and uh, to watch part of what she, list, she said um, before we start the talk of this uh, amazing facility. Yeah, so the climate resilient road. And when the country was hit by a very powerful typhoon, one of the roads that was able to withstand the strong woods, uh, winds is a road that MCC had helped finance. And so the important thing is not only that the road was still there, which means you didn't have to finance it again to build it again, but because the road was still there, emergency workers were able to travel on it to get help to people. It allowed uh, goods and services and people to move. So that is one of the reasons uh, why climate, uh, 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 working on climate change is so important to us and to making sure that um, everything we do, particularly in the infrastructure space, um, is absolutely, at minimum, climate resilient. So let's talk about um, policies, uh, because uh, in addition to the grant that you mentioned that uh, MCC supports countries with, um, what kinds of policies do you think are very, very important for countries to adopt, uh, to be able to, uh, that are also well aligned with all the visionary climate goals and objectives that MCC's project can also be, uh, that your project can also be used to support. Okay, so Paul, you mentioned the word vision. So I think for countries today, a very clear compass, sort of the embodiment of vision, is in the nationally determined uh, contributions, the NDCs. And so we're seeing uh, more and more of the countries that we work in uh, develop NDCs. Um, if they want, we can help them to strengthen their NDCs, and certainly we want to make sure that the activities we do in their countries is helping to back and support their NDCs. For example, we just finished negotiations um, with the Gambia and we'll be working in the energy sector and everything we'll be doing in that energy sector will also be supportive of the Gambia's um, NDCs. Um, and then also, as um, evolutions happen, I'll again stay with energy, so we see a lot of countries who have very um, important goals in terms of trying to move more and more towards renewable energy. But again, there you need to create the right framework um, for renewable energy, particularly if you're trying to get the private sector to come in and help finance, for example, solar projects. And so MCC will work with countries to create the right regulatory and policy environment uh, for renewable energy, including solar, helping uh, to um, make it so that independent power purchasers are interested in the country and willing to come in. So that's just one example, but we see many, many examples when it comes to um, off-grid as well or energy efficiency. All of these are new issues that require the right progressive policy environment to support them. So let's look at um, some of the major announcements uh, at the uh, COP26. Uh, which ones of these, uh, which uh, which of these uh, major announcements uh, are best aligned with emphasis innovation? Uh, what to do and uh, how? A certain part of the question, which is on these NDC issues, uh, how committed do you think countries are? and uh, how substantial and how reliable because a country can just write something and say this is our NDC. So how reliable are you uh, to use these NDCs as a metric to support governments? Yeah. Um, so on, your, on the first part of your question, um, I'm incredibly part, proud as a member of the U.S. delegation um, that in the lead up to COP, at the General Assembly, President Biden announced that the U.S. would be quadrupling um, its uh, commitment uh, uh, of climate finance to developing countries. Um, so it would be four times greater than the amount at the peak of the U.S. commitments under Obama. So I'm very, very proud of that commitment, and MCC certainly um, is part of, of the range of institutions that will help um, to deliver on that commitment. I'm also very pleased that that quadrupling of climate finance for developing countries includes um, increasing the amount of finance for adaptation by six times its previous uh, level under the peak of Obama, because adaptation, particularly in the countries where MCC works in, low and low middle income countries, is really the critical issues. These are not the countries that created the emissions that got us to where we are today, but they are really at the front lines of the negative impact. And so um, th that financing will be absolutely critical. So that's something I'm very proud of in terms of the commitments um, that are related to, to COP. Um, in terms of your questions um, with respect to the NDCs, we're on a journey, Paul, and I think 
what's important is that we're seeing a momentum that is going in one direction, which is towards improvement. Are all countries' NDCs as strong, as robust, as clear, as inclusive of all parts of governments as they need to be? No. But are we in the right direction? Yes. So MCC can help not only back what is in countries' um, NDCs, but we can also help strengthen countries' MDCs. So we, for example, adopted a new climate strategy in April of this year uh, alongside the Climate Leader Summit. Um, and one of the things that we have in our uh, policy is stepping up our work to support countries enabling environments, including helping them um, refine, strengthen, and implement their NDCs. So it's a work in progress. Um, some countries have more robust NDCs than others. COP, I think, helped us get even more robust NDCs, because I think that's one of the things that, you know, as countries were working towards COP26, they wanted to come with something that was really robust. Um, and we want to be part of that journey um, with the countries that we work with. Then, um, as a U.S. Uh, government-linked establishment, um, how can we? How can the rest of the world guarantee, uh, be rest assured, that um, MCC's involvement, their partnerships with the NDC, the kinds of support they can get to from the NDC, uh, sorry, MCC, uh, will always be there, uh, irrespective of which party is in government. No, thanks a lot for that question. You know, MCC really prides itself as an independent uh, bilateral development agency to really enjoy bipartisan support. And we always have since our creation in 2014 um, under President Bush. Um, we've really enjoyed bipartisan support for our work. And I think um, that is because we have a very a transparent and clear model um, that underpins our work. Um, and what I mean by that is, first of all, um, the way that we uh, identify countries that we can uh, work in is based on a very transparent uh, scorecard um, um, that establishes the eligibility of countries. The way we decide what to do and what drives our decisions about what we do in a country is based on analytical work um, that we do. We do constraints to growth analysis, we do cost-benefit analysis, we do economic rate of returns for each project. So we use that underpinning of sound economics to guide what we do. And the final thing I want to raise here is that one of our core principles is country ownership, which means that we are there to support countries in where they want to go. And so if you follow the data and the evidence, if you follow countries and their own development priorities, um, then I think you are really guided by principles that hold true uh, notwithstanding uh, whoever may be uh, in power in the United States. Those principles are principles that I think are valued by, um, uh, and our experience has shown, by administration over administration. I'd like to drive yeah. to be able to do multimedia at any event. So I use my camera, it's connected to my laptop. Uh, I have um, my uh, tripod stand and a lot of pocket stuff. So what we are going to do is, um, so that is my event uh, coverage uh, setup, and um, from there we can, uh, you, I'm able to do photos, I'm able to do videos, and I'm able to also um, take pictures and uh, interview uh, individuals. So uh, from here we will see. Uh, so currently, um, this is what uh, the, uh, where I said uh, the journalist uh, from different. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm not with my face mask. It's <laughs> it's a serious crime uh, here to be with that face mask. Yeah. So so one second. Mm -hmm. But if you steal my device, <laughs> yeah. So um, every time that I get to walk, you will be able to see um, the fact that um, journalism has come um, so far. And um, it's not uh, 
Why we agree that journalists are condemned? We also have to come to terms with the fact that um, this pandemic has been uh, one unique and has had unique impact on uh, journalism in general. So, because uh, even though everybody is here, we usually have to rely on the TV for us to watch uh, most of the sessions because of social distancing. And um, it's something that uh, many have actually complained about uh, because uh, it's, it limits the access um, that we have. But this is not to say that uh, we can still get it from. And uh, as you can see, um, we can actually, uh, this is another very massive media uh, spot where uh, uh, journalists can actually watch the sessions and uh, and then uh, and so just to tell you to show you how serious um the organizers actually went. I think there is an interview in here. Yeah this is a radio. I think uh, this yeah this is for the radio sessions and um so they from this feed uh, normally you don't they really did some really impressive work. Uh, uh, ensuring that uh, journalists don't have to be there. So most of the coverage are uh, done, you do it at the work post. For instance, this is, this is the spot for uh, as well. You can see the different uh, sessions. You can monitor different sessions from different feeds. You can click and uh, you can plug in your stuff there. And still go there. This is what COVID-19 has done journalism to. Before, even when media centers like this exist, uh, you still have to do many things, but many, even though uh, we are here, you have to have things to rely on the virtual platform uh, for, for us to be able to do things. So it's actually incredible. Uh, some media offices are able to actually get um, our private sessions uh, where they broadcast their stuff. And we have a spot uh, if you want to address press, you come there. And um, we have amazing uh, organizers. Uh, so before I can enter this space, um, I would have to actually show the security staff uh, this badge. This badge enables you to be able to access and this place. The weather is very good, but I just have to show off my and you have this t shirt uh, with uh, easy identification. Um, so what? There is nothing on this app anymore, so I want to take it to where most of the action is. So I'm running. Um, so let me flip over again. So, yeah, so this kind of stuff enables you to see the different uh, locations. And yeah, so this is where it, it gets crazy. Um, like the horse, yeah, as you can see, any spot can be turned into a interview session. Any spot can be turned into an interview session. So, um, we have um, journalists and meetings happening everywhere. Uh, most of the time, uh, you can just walk to anybody. Uh, my whole strategy has always been. Ask questions, quickly scan these name tags, quickly scan these name tags so that you can be able to identify where these people are from. And you can actually, because you know the key terminologies or the key issues that they are actually dealing with, uh, each question each country is dealing with, you can actually also start to add your questions like your finger. So the journalists have self spot here. As you can see, lots of live transmissions actually happen. And um, there are lots of... So this is where most of the ways you can get stuff to have, uh, to people to interview, you can actually do it there. I think those ones are also going live. And um, as you can see, we there can give from this, look at this, uh, we have uh, people transmitting on even over uh, to actually transmit. Okay, uh, something has happened on this all. This was where the president, uh, this is where they do the regulations. And nobody will allow you to pass here. Um, so as you can see, they check, they check the tags. Unfortunately, um, but journalists are always there to catch, um, to catch 
uh, as much short as they can. I remember one day I was just on the first, second day. Yes, I was on this horse. And I said, there some people choking around that what was happening. So the president of France, like everybody wanted to catch a glimpse for. But this is the line to which our journalists are able to uh, enter. And as you can see, these are where the, uh, the plenary sessions uh, happen. It's just a lot of deliberations, it's just a lot of uh, interrogations, uh, people going from one meeting to another, trying to agree and trying to actually secure uh, interviews. So that is how we just, we just go around uh, hoping to catch the best of news. And uh, for those that are unable to be at COP26, what I consider to be the more be the better advantage that you have over those that are here is the opportunity that you have to actually see. most of all of the sessions, public sessions are being streamed. Uh, just go to UNFCC's website and uh, you can actually see the top line. Like still, as you can see, we always have to rely on the TV. So even if you are here, uh, most of the time, you have to still um, rely on, on TVs, uh, on the laptops for you because uh, they are describing this particular cop as the most restricted because of COVID. the claim is COVID. And uh, they are trying to do transparency and uh, it's very difficult for you to do that, to claim it's, it's a transparent process when you cannot have people at these uh, events. So that's the thing you can, but you're always going to see lots of people um, at all of these uh, sessions. Yeah, so there's a lot and lots and lots and lots of people. Uh, something that I mean, I'm not sure if you are following is the fact that um, it is really, really, um, sometimes you spend up to one hour trying to. Uh, so, hi, how are you doing? Hi uh, what is happening here? What's happening? Yeah. We're just, um, well, we're from this place called the Eden Project, and we're talking about how we connect people with nature okay. from our base. And these are some of the projects that we're working on to show that projects projects are happening, thing, good things are happening to help address climate change and biodiversity loss. Okay. And we use plants, technology, art, science to on a whole load of projects around the world. Yeah, so are you satisfied so far with what is happening at Four Twenty Six with the rest of To be honest. <laughs> We've just been here. I have no idea what's happening in the rest. <laughs> <laughs> but what has been the response to the people from what people are saying coming here? Are you are they oh, satisfied? Yeah, no, are you motivated? Oh yeah, people people are really enjoying this space because I think it feels very different from everything else. We deliberately made it. Oh yeah. With warm light, bird song, real plants. And so it feels like a little bit of the natural world has come in here and and people come in here and they go, oh, this is nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's nice. I've been saying this is the first day and um, I've not been able to come around yet. So I was but like, yeah, I'm really happy a, that I'm here. That's exactly what everybody says. We've been walking past here and now we've got chance to stop. And it just, we wanted to make something eye-catching. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you, I think you achieved that. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank have you. a nice day. <laughs> Yeah, so um, most of the time, just have to be spontaneous uh, for you to be able to talk to people. Uh, you don't, uh, if you're a very shy person, uh, that you're shy to talk to people, you may not enjoy, <laughs> you may not be able to get really good stories. Yeah, so we have that. I think we have a Let me show you the first. We are unstoppable, another world is possible. 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 We are unst
Yeah, so you cannot, um, you cannot predict what you are going to see. The first thing you are seeing is see it, and um, everybody has a mission, everybody has a plan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the things that is increasingly becoming obvious is the fact that um, everybody here, um, I'm not sure if any pro or any speech uh, like Sir David's speech could change uh, the minds of many of the key stakeholders uh, regarding any issue. Uh, it seems that everybody has already made up their minds about what they want for their country or what they have about their issue. And one of the places to have fun are the pavilions. Uh, we have pavilions on different issues and um, events are also happening. Uh, on the, the different pavilions. Um, this is the train. Yeah, lots of um, yeah, lots of events. I think this is China's uh, pavilion. Yeah, then we also have Korea. Not so much is happening here. Um, we have uh, Korea um, also for uh, the stand uh, right over here. So most of the time, okay, one of the things I've come to discover as a journalist is, um, yeah, well, you can see representatives from the different governments at the different pavilions. It's very rare for them, for you to see the usefully because every night you see is top PR. We just PR, uh, putting their best foot forward. Uh, but once in a while, you just have to look at the tags of anybody that you see here. So this was where I did the interview with uh, Dr. Jan. Like I said, uh, I was just sitting there and I saw him and uh, we had that uh, interesting conversation. So it's always good for you to build relationships and uh, just look around. As you can see, you don't know where your story will be. Uh, so until you have a better understanding, uh, be able to have on the spot moment uh, to wait to connect uh, really uh, with the people and uh, be able to quickly have a uh, conversation uh, uh, too. That would be uh, okay. So, lots of sessions already, I can say that. Hello. Okay, we have the Commonwealth stand too. Uh, I think I just started a session. Now, look at one of the bodies you should understand is the fact that how do you keep up with all of these events? How? It's almost. The things that I do, uh, there are two approaches that I will recommend. The first approach is have a plan, know the kinds of issues you want to talk about, uh, know the kinds of issues that you want to talk about, and um, be able to have at this moment. If you see what I do with that interview, I really do. You can see, I didn't even know she would be there, but I had 
an interest. I've had my own background on the issues that are considered to be uh, very, very uh, important. So you can never be short of meetings of those that you can meet. And uh, as you can see, as a journalist, whether you are TV or radio, you should always be prepared uh, to go live uh, anywhere. Uh, it's really, really important uh, for you to have that at uh, the spawn moment, on the spawn moment. But most importantly, um, if you are not here, one of the tools I've also been using uh, to be able to still cover as much as I can uh, is to be able to go back to the websites and the streaming platforms that these various organizations are using. And um, depending, depending on which platform you visit, Okay, yeah, I think something happened here yesterday. Yeah, yesterday right here, you cannot know you're going to be at this course. I was just trying to find somebody to interview. And I saw people gathering there. And um, when I looked around, uh, it was actually Bill Gates himself that was there. Yeah. So you, because unfortunately, uh, because of the mass, you may not be able to clearly see this is the person, but you have to be able to be on the feet to ask the right question. Yeah, I think um, I think I've really taken your time much today, and um, I hope uh, I've been able to give you uh, as much uh, COP26 experience as I can give you with limited capabilities. One question that people had was that um, why holding and gathering people this many? Uh, in a single hall. So this is the WHO uh, World Health Organization uh, pavilion. And uh, so one thing I like about what there's a WHO pavilion is you can actually see uh, they are actually live streaming. They are streaming their session. Most of the sessions they are being streamed live. But back to the question that I raised, and I think uh, is a good way uh, to wrap things up today. So during the press briefing with the UN, um, uh, with the COP26 presidents, that particular question was asked that why gather these many people at the same venue uh, in a pandemic? And the question, the answer was simple. There is an urgent need to solve the climate crisis. There is an urgent need for stakeholders to come together and actually discuss in person, look each one in the each other in the eye. So I try to talk about And we can see lots of uh, measures that have been taken to be able to actually uh, be able to actually get uh, ahead of this thing and actually move on with the rise. But this seems to be a real test of how the new normal is going to be. The new normal regarding how does the world move on uh, from the pandemic, how does the world resume events in the pandemic? And I think we are having a better understanding of what moving on would truly look like. When we got here, the first day that we got here, each of us received the three parts of test. Every day before I'm allowed to get into this hall, I have to test myself and submit the results. So, which means everybody in this hall has actually test, uh, conducted the own and reported the same COVID. These are from COVID 19 testing. How normal that is going to be in the next future, we don't know. But this to me seems to be uh, the new normal where we are able, as you can see, masks are everywhere. COVID 19 will continue to be an issue. How many organizations can afford to set up? to provide free testing for these thousands of people is what we don't know. What the person is doing.